again. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Professor Jared Rathel. For lesson 5-4, we're going to, again, ecologically scale up. Today, we're going to be thinking like landscape or ecosystem ecologists. Specifically, we're going to consider how energy, its acquisition and transfer, ultimately structures all of the ecosystems that we see on planet Earth today. Let's begin with one of my favorite species, the killer whale or orca, the scientific name Orcinus orca. It's the largest member of the dolphin family. Killer whales are highly intelligent, extremely sociable. Populations are composed of matrilineal family groups called pods, which are the most stable of any of the animal species. Killer whales have extremely sophisticated hunting techniques and vocal behaviors, which are often specific to a particular pod and passed down across generations in what is best described as animal culture. So what do killer whales eat? Well, it depends. There are at least three different genetically distinct races of killer whales on the planet today that have not interbred in some 10,000 years. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature reports the taxonomy of this genus is clearly in need of review, and it is likely that Orchinus orca needs to be split into a number of different species or at least subspecies. Remember, the biological species concept can be fairly arbitrary as gene pools begin to split apart. Resident killer whales are the most commonly sighted of these three distinct races. They're found in the coastal waters of the northwestern United States and southeast Alaska. Resident killer whales' diets consist primarily of large fish, so these are the salmon hunting specialists. Female resident whales character characteristically have rounded dorsal fin tips that terminate in a sharp corner. We're beginning to see morphological differences between these races. These resident killer whales visit the same areas consistently. British Columbia and Washington resident populations are among the most intensively studied marine mammal populations anywhere in the world. Researchers have identified over 300 killer whale individuals over the past 30 years. But other races specialize on different prey items, larger prey items. Only pods that live in the waters near the Valdez Peninsula in Argentina exhibit this unique and learned hunting technique that's found no place else in the world. The transient, or Biggs killer whales, are the second race of killer whales that prey almost exclusively on marine mammals. Transients generally travel in small groups, usually of two to six individuals, and they're going to roam widely up and down the continental coast in both the northern and the southern hemisphere. They are keenly aware of seal and sea lion puppying grounds, as well as other predictable events like penguin migrations in Antarctica highly intelligent species. The third race of killer whales are the offshore or pelagic whales. As their name suggests, they're going to spend their entire lives far from the coastlines, way offshore in the endless blue. So little is known about the pelagic whales' habits other than that they are genetically quite distinct from both transient and resident killer whales. 
These offshore whales will congregate in groups of 20 to 75 individuals. Occasionally, there have been sightings of like 200 of these whales getting together. They're thought primarily to feed on schooling fish working together and other pelagic organisms, offshore, deep sea, open ocean organisms like dolphins and even sharks. Like you see this killer whale that's preying upon this tiger shark. Killer whales are truly the apex predators in our oceans. So here's a quick diagram showing the morphological differences that have emerged as these populations speciate across both the northern and southern hemispheres. But again, today, we're thinking about energy and ecosystems. So let's follow a food chain from the killer whales at the top shown working cooperatively here to tip that marine mammal off of its iceberg. But what does that marine mammal eat? So how does this sea lion get its energy? Quick note, sea lions are sexually sized dimorphic, meaning they have two different forms. The male is on the right side and he dwarfs the female on the left. Sea lions voraciously consume large fatty fish like salmon. Where do those salmon, born in freshwater streams but growing into adults in the ocean, where do they get their energy? The salmon are going to eat smaller fish like sardines, anchovies, and this sprat. Where does this shiny little fish, this sprat, get its energy from? By eating the zooplankton. Zoo is Greek for animal and plankton Greek for wanderer or drifter. These are all those little microscopic animals like the krill that you see on the top left, tiny little newly hatched squid and jellyfish, as well as a myriad of protozoans that are adrift in our ocean currents. How did the zooplankton acquire their energy? They consume phytoplankton. Phyto is Greek for plant. These are the microscopic drifting green algae, the cyanobacteria and the diatoms and dinoflagellates. This is what forms the foundation of all life in the oceans. And where do these phytoplankton acquire their energy? from an incredible nuclear fusion reaction some 93 million miles away from our star, our sun. This food chain illustrates what ecosystem ecologists refer to as the pyramid of numbers, where the most abundant, the most numerous organisms, the phytoplankton, are at the base of the pyramid. The second most abundant organisms are the zooplankton. Similarly, there are always less salmon than there are sprat, and less orcas than there are sea lions. Similarly, the pyramid of biomass exhibits the exact same pattern. So if we could somehow take all of the orcas in the ocean and get them on a scale and mass that tier of biomass, even though individual orcas weigh much, much more than any individual zooplankton, the sheer number of zooplankton in the oceans equates to many orders of magnitude more biomass at the zooplankton level than we find locked up in the orcas. So on your assessment, biomass is going to decrease every time we move up a link in a food chain. But what does that biomass actually represent? In other words, why are there always going to be more herring fish than there are orcas? 
more elk than there are wolves, more gazelles than cheetahs. That biomass, that biological tissue is energy. Einstein taught us that E equals mc squared. So energy is equivalent to mass times the speed of light squared. Two big ideas that you need to take from this lecture. First, ecologists are going to use trophic models, food chains and food webs, to represent how energy is captured and moves through ecosystems. Second, and this is a big idea, every time we move up a level in a food chain, up a trophic level, 90% of the available energy at that level is lost to that food chain. It is not transferred. Thus, biomass is going to decline every tier we move up. By the time we get to the apex predators on the top, those killer whales and African lions, there simply is very little energy left to support large numbers. Energy is what structures every ecosystem on the planet. The ecosystem represents the interactions between biotic, the living communities, and their abiotic physical environments. Both the abiotic and biotic components influence one another in complex ways. For example, the depth of the snow, an abiotic factor, is going to influence elk as well as the wolves that prey upon those elk in deep snow. But the wolves also influence the abiotic components. The return of wolves in Yellowstone National Park has changed the rivers. One of the most exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. And the classic example is what happened in the Yellowstone National Park in the United States when wolves were reintroduced in 1995. Now, we, we all know that various species of animals, but perhaps we're slightly less aware that they give life to many others. Before the wolves turned up, they'd been absent for 70 years, that the numbers of deer, because there was nothing to hunt them, had built up and built up in the Yellowstone Park, and despite efforts by humans to control them, they'd managed to reduce much of the vegetation there to almost nothing. They'd just grazed it away. But as soon as the wolves arrived, even though they were few in number, they started to have the most remarkable effects. First, of course, they killed some of the deer, but that wasn't the major thing. Much more significantly, they radically changed the behavior of the deer. The deer started avoiding certain parts of the park, the places where they could be trapped most easily, particularly the valleys and the gorges. And immediately, those places started to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees quintupled in just six years. Bare valley sides quickly became forests of aspen and willow and cottonwood. And as soon as that happened, the birds started moving in. The number of songbirds and migratory birds started to increase greatly. The number of beavers started to increase because beavers like to, to eat the trees. And Beavers, like wolves, are ecosystem engineers. They create niches for other species. And the dams they built in the rivers um, provided habitats for otters and muskrats and ducks and fish and reptiles and amphibians. The wolves killed coyotes. And as a result of that, the number of rabbits and mice began to rise, which meant more hawks, 
More weasels, more foxes, more badgers. Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on the carrion that the wolves had left. Bears fed on it too, and their population began to rise as well, partly also because there were more berries growing on the regenerating shrubs. And the bears reinforced the impact of the wolves by killing some of the calves of the deer. But here's where it gets really interesting. The wolves changed the behavior of the rivers. They began to meander less. There was less erosion, the channels narrowed, more pools formed, more riffle sections, all of which were great for wildlife habitats. The rivers changed in response to the wolves. And the reason was that the regenerating forests stabilized the banks so that they collapsed less often, so that the rivers became more fixed in their course. Similarly, by driving the deer out of some places and the vegetation recovering on the valley sides, there was a soil erosion because the vegetation stabilized that as well. So the wolves, small in number, transformed not just the ecosystem of the Yellowstone National Park, this huge area of land, but also its physical geography. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. I love that video. Uh, just a quick side note. So the Europeans call elk red deer. That's why the narrator was continually referring to the elk as deer. But for now, we're going to head to a freshwater lake in Florida. At the base of this ecosystem, we find the primary producers. These are the autotrophs, the self-feeders, the organisms that are capable of doing photosynthesis. So in this freshwater lake, this is our phytoplankton, as well as our aquatic plants. In Yellowstone National Park, of course, it's the incredible plant communities. So in 99.99% of the ecosystems on planet Earth, at the base, we're going to find photosynthetic organisms. The one exception are the deep sea hydrothermal vents, where these amazing tube worms with, that have entered into a mutualistic relationship with chemosynthetic bacteria. Um, but that's a lecture for another day. The primary producers are consumed by the primary consumers. So these are the herbivores in the ecosystem. In this lake, these are our zooplankton, things like copiapods and cladocerans and rotifers, as well as our segmented worms and amphiopods. The primary consumers are your herbivores. In Yellowstone, this would be your elk. The primary consumers are consumed by the secondary consumers. Secondary consumers are carnivores. They're eating flesh. They're eating herbivores. So in this lake, we've got the small fish like uh, shad that you see here, the little herring. The Atlantic sturgeon is a ancient fish. It's a very large fish, but it actually eats low on the food web. And then we've got uh, the larval stages of uh, higher order predators uh, like bass. And then at the very top of this system, we have what are called the tertiary consumers. These are the apex predators in this system. These are the carnivores that eat carnivores. Things like the largemouth bass that you see on the bottom right, the cormorant, uh, which is a diving bird going after fish, and of course, people, right? When we eat uh, bass, we are tertiary or quaternary consumers. Question and it shows up on your assessment. Can an organism like the blue crab in that Florida lake, can it exist at more than one trophic level? Yeah, it sure can. Depends on what that crab is eating. Is it eating aquatic vegetation or is it eating mudworms? So I hope you remember the discussion that we had during the beginning of our population ecology lecture uh, when I talked about eating orange roughy versus eating arthropods. Humans are another great example. We have the choice to eat 
at various tiers in the food web, at various trophic levels. We can choose to be primary consumers and eat that veggie burger that you see on the left, or we can eat at the very top of the food web and choose to eat things like shark steaks like you see on the right. So here's an amazing factoid for you. Every day, planet Earth receives enough solar radiation to supply our entire human population with its energy needs for 19 years. That's how much solar radiation, how much sunlight bathes our planet every day. I have to believe that your generation is going to be the one that finally weans us off of fossil fuels and transitions this economy to, to renewable energy sources, limitless energy, clean energy. Of all that solar radiation that bathes our planet daily, only 1% is captured by photosynthetic organisms like the corn you see here and converted into the chemical energy glucose. 99% of that solar radiation is absorbed or reflected and never enters an ecosystem. Most energy that is captured in the form of glucose by photosynthetic organisms never even transfers to the primary consumers because biological organisms are not terribly efficient. Consider this caterpillar munching on a leaf. Here it consumes 200 joules worth of leaf material. A joule is a precise measure of energy. There are 4.2 joules in one calorie. Of the 200 joules consumed by the caterpillar, half, 50%, are not even assimilated by the organism. They pass right through its gut and are excreted as energy-rich feces. Of the 100 joules that are assimilated, two-thirds of those are lost doing cellular respiration. That's the business of converting that glucose into ATP that's required for the caterpillar to carry out all of its life functions, like inching along and finding more leaf to eat. So of those 200 joules consumed by the caterpillar, only 33 actually become new caterpillar cells, caterpillar biomass that's then available for consumption by carnivores. Finally, that brings us to our energy pyramid. If one million joules of sunlight strike a field, only 1% of that energy, or 10,000 joules, are captured by the photosynthetic sunflowers you see here, the primary producers. Only 1,000 joules then transfers to the grasshoppers. 90% of that energy is lost from this food chain. The mouse eats the grasshopper, and only 100 joules then transfers to the secondary consumers. Again, 90% is lost. That leaves us with only 10 joules at the top remaining to support rattlesnakes. And this is why there are always more deer mice than there are rattlesnakes. Energy structures our ecosystems. So I say the word lost, but we recognize that energy is not lost in the sense that it's destroyed. Energy is never created nor destroyed. It simply changes form in an endless dance. Further, every time a rattlesnake eats a mouse, every time there is an energy transfer in an ecosystem, the entropy, the disorder, in the universe increases. One of the reasons why I love science is because of the never-ending discoveries that science brings us. So that little red arrow that you see before you, 
That is the most isolated coral reef on the planet. It's also a window into what coral reefs used to look like before we fished them out. That's the Fakarava Atoll. An atoll is an ancient volcano that has eroded back into the sea, leaving a ring of coral surrounding a shallow lagoon. In the Fakarava Atoll, marine biologists have documented an inverse biomass pyramid, where the biomass of the apex predators, these reef sharks, is greater than the secondary and primary consumers' biomass, the biomass of the grouper and the butterfly fish. So you're familiar with the pyramid of numbers on the left and the pyramid of biomass in the middle. That's where we started. The Fakarava Atoll, careful, don't say that the wrong way, is an inverted biomass pyramid where biomass of the sharks exceeds the lower trophic levels. But don't worry, Fakarava is not defying the laws of physics. It's really just a question of scale. You just have to check this out. This is the most amazing night dive on the planet.